It's a brass tacks exclusive as the war in Ukraine rages with a possible Ukrainian counteroffensive going to start in the next few days. Uh, Saudi Arabia has also decided to cut production to boost oil prices. There is going to be a major impact on global dynamics to try and decode the future trajectory of this war and also its potential implications, both strategic and economic. Uh, I'm now joined by the chief economics commentator of the Financial Times newspaper, Mr. Martin Wolf. Mr. Martin Wolf, thank you very much for speaking with us here on Brass Tax. Uh, let, let's talk about the Ukraine war because this has been the most consequential thing that's happened in the last uh, year, year and a half. There's a lot of chatter now around a possible Ukrainian counteroffensive. There was a video that was tweeted out by the Ministry of Defense today saying it's going to be a silent counteroffensive. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, has gone around telling world reader, leaders it's just a matter of days before this counteroffensive begins. How do you see this war playing itself out through this summer offensive? Well, I have to uh, stress that I'm an expert, if I'm an expert at all, on economics rather than strategy and military strategy. So I'm relying on the views of others. Uh, and I think my sense is there are very widely divergent views among strategic experts on the West on what will happen with this counteroffensive, from the possibility that the Russians have now le learnt enough and have dug themselves in enough and have created enough defensive uh, um, artillery and uh, uh, soldiers to actually defeat the, the counteroffensive. Um, the general rule, as I'm sure you know in military affairs, is that you need a very substantial um, uh, um, military preponderance uh, across the, all the arms if you are to win in a, an offensive against a well-entrenched opponent. Ukraine is obviously a smaller country with a smaller army. So uh, it's a perfectly plausible view that uh, despite the assistance Ukraine has got from the West with equipment, that it just won't have enough to break through and fundamentally reverse the def and defeat the defensive positions of the Russians. So that's one point of view that will be very important. It would be, be becoming a stalemate then. Okay. The other possibility, which is the more optimistic view, is that there will be breakthroughs, that they can concentrate enough forces at strategic points, break through, overwhelm the largely unwilling Russian conscripts, and uh, start taking back substantial amounts of the occupied territory, uh, which Russia still clings to at this stage in the war. And I think the honest proof, truth is, from my point of view, is that we don't know. Um, there's considerable doubt about how it will go. But I f have a feeling that towards the end of the summer, we will have a much clearer view than we now do of the future of this so, war militarily. Is so it a stalemate? Or is it going to be a fundamental defeat for Russia? It doesn't seem very likely, at least in the near future, medium future, unless we stop arming Ukraine, that Russia will be able actually to defeat Ukraine and conquer it. That seems more or less inconceivable. But the other two outcomes are still alive. So the, the, the point then is something's got to give. You have the situation where Ukraine, uh, as things stand today, has to settle for some of its territory, uh, which was in its control before the war began, now in Russian territory. And that is not something that is acceptable uh, to Zelensky. On the other hand, for Russia, and particularly for Putin, what is the off-ramp that's being offered by the West, the United States and Europe, which could be acceptable to Putin to bring an end to this war? I think that... Uh, the answer to both of these uh, questions is it's not clear. Uh, and we're still, I think, at an early stage of what is likely to be a very long, complex uh, conflict. Um, the right Ukrainians certainly haven't accepted that they can't get back their territory. Uh, if the offensive goes very well, they might be able to get a substantial part of their uh, territory in eastern Ukraine. If they were able to do so, they could cut off Crimea from um, overland uh, support. And in the long run, I think the Ukrainians hope that will allow them even to get Crimea back, though this is, of course, 
uh, very, very unlikely to happen, as you suggest, in the near future. Now, from Putin's point of view, he might well take the view that not losing is winning, i.e. he will have gained a substantial part of eastern Ukraine, which he sometimes seems to indicate is uh, his uh, priority, he seems to have changed his views on this not infrequently, and he might take the view that that's enough. Uh, now, um, so let's suppose that you're right, that the, the Ukrainians do not reconquer all of the East, certainly not Crimea, uh, but, but on the other hand, Russia doesn't decisively defeat Ukraine and break through. What are the outcomes? I think my view for a long time is that the most likely outcome is a piece of exhaustion, not a peace at all, a ceasefire. Uh, um, at least a ceasefire in which neither side accepts the outcome, but nobody wants to go on. Um, that means that neither side accepts defeat, neither side actually is a win victory. And I should point out that Korea has had a ceasefire since the early 1950s, nothing's ever been settled. Um, I don't know whether that would be possible. A full okay. peace in which, the, in which, which would rely, which would create a situation which both sides are prepared to accept seems to me very, very remote at, at the moment. I don't know how it will be guaranteed, which would be crucial. I don't think that Putin can afford to to give up in that way. Uh, I think it will be lethal for him. And I think Zelensky and the Ukrainians are determined to regain their country. So and if Russian soldiers remain bit, there, they will be very uh, concerned. One of the fears, one of the so fears full, that the West has, uh, Sir Martin Wolf, uh, particularly the United States, its European partners, is, is if Putin is pushed to a corner, uh, what could his potential response be? Could Russia, for example, resort to using tactical nuclear weapons? Uh, is that a possibility? And, and, you know, if that's going to happen, then how does the West counter it? Well, it's obviously a possibility. Uh, one of my rules in life is that if you're predicting the, the future outcomes on the psychology of one human being, you have a terrible problem. Uh, because... A single human being, as surely all of us know, if we're adults, can do very strange things. Uh, so I don't know what Putin would do in the situation in which he is being defeated. Uh, I, My guess is, and it is, uh, I think, a reasonably informed guess, that Putin is pretty cautious, ultimately. Uh, he showed it famously in the long table he sat at uh, so that all his colleagues were 30 yards away when he was frightened of COVID. He must be concerned that uh, uh, starting with nuclear weapons would lead to um, really quite dangerous outcomes. And I have a strong suspicion, though I can't be sure, I don't know directly, that the Chinese will be massively opposed to this move, and he really does depend on China. So my guess is that it is far more likely than not that he will not use nuclear weapons, um, uh, but I'm not sure, and I don't think anybody can be sure, except okay. possibly Mr. Putin, and maybe not even himself. I also wanted to ask you about this recent decision, a decision that happened over the weekend by Saudi Arabia to cut down uh, on oil production. Obviously, this is going to lead to a rise in prices. And any rise in price is always going to help Russia because Russia is a big exporter of oil. Uh, what do you make of this decision by Saudi Arabia and this whole thing about, you know, the Russian economy collapsing because its oil exports have been sanctioned around the world? That hasn't quite come to pass. Well, there are two different questions there. It's perfectly clear, and I expected it, that Russian oil will be rerouted. Uh, uh, and countries like yours and China have got a bargain uh, as a result. As I understand, the, the oil is significantly cheaper than world prices, uh, though I, you would know more about this than I do, and Russia is a forced seller. Uh, so, uh, and I've, so I've discussed in previous interviews with Indian uh, broadcasters, uh, um, 
uh, I think it's perfectly rational for India and China and other importers to take advantage of this opportunity. It means Russia is selling oil at a discount, but um, it means, as you rightly say, it continued to fund itself. I think it was probably never plausible that the West could prevent that. Um, I never thought it was very plausible that the West could prevent it. The important parts of the sanctions, from my point of view, have been that they have greatly accelerated the energy transition in Europe, which is a good thing for us. And uh, and the it does seem to be making it more difficult for the for Russia to build high quality armaments. Um, because of all the imported inputs they need. So those are the two things where it's worked uh, reasonably successfully. Now, Saudi Arabia's decision is actually really quite interesting to me. It shows, but of course we've known this periodically ever since 1973, that um, OPEC structures uh, continue to work. They can take advantage of opportunities to tighten output and raise prices. The oil, the the war has helped them. Russia is inevitably, ineluctably part of this, quite indirectly because of the obstacles to its imports. What interests me a little is that some of its newer allies, uh, like China, most of Saudi Arabia's new allies, and I put this in quotation marks, but obviously to some extent a friendly relationship. Um, um, wouldn't particularly like higher oil prices. I mean, China is a large net oil importer, as is India. So yeah. it seems to me that Saudi Arabia has to be moderately careful that it doesn't only alienate its old allies, it also alienates its new allies. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's going to be quite cautious. But historically, Saudi Arabia always has been cautious about this, but it is always consistently supported OPEC and been prepared to make... Uh, uh, output cuts when needed to sustain prices. It done so in the teeth of the unipolar moment of the US, and I don't find anything really thrillingly new here. All right, we'll leave it at that. Uh, so Martin Wolf, uh, Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times, many thanks for speaking with us here on News.